Historians know a lot about ancient Egypt, but there are still enormous gaps in their knowledge. In fact, a book of the things we don't know about Egypt would be a lot longer than a book of the things we do know about it. Let's see if we can fill in a few of the gaps in your knowledge with the contents of this video. Our first stunning Egyptian discovery is a recent one. It's a large funerary building dating back to the Ptolemaic and Roman periods of ancient Egypt, and it's been found in Fayum City. The discovery was confirmed on December 1, 2022 by archaeologists at the Garza Archaeological Site in Fayum. Fayum has existed since the days of the Old Kingdom, and was first established as a religious center for a cult that worshipped the crocodile-headed deity Sobek. The newly discovered funerary building is made from stone blocks and contains dozens of rock-cut burial chambers. More impressively, it also has a large central floor decorated with lime mortar and covered in colored floor tiles, making it look a little like a checkerboard. Most of the burial chambers are occupied, and many contain painted wooden coffins featuring depictions of the deceased. Coffin paintings of this kind are almost unique to this part of Egypt, which is why they are known as Fayum portraits. Bizarrely, one of the coffins was found to contain a terracotta statue of the goddess Isis, rather than human remains. Archaeologists and historians aren't yet sure what to make of that. It's a little-known fact about Egyptian mummy discoveries that some of them have blonde or red hair. For a long time, it was thought that the coloring was a product of the mummification process, as scientists and historians both felt that the Egyptians could only have had black or very dark brown hair. We now know that isn't true. In 2016, Dr. Janet Davey from the Victorian Institute of Forensic Medicine in Australia published a detailed study in which she demonstrated that the chemicals known to have been used in the mummification had no impact on hair coloring whatsoever. The hair colors must, therefore, be natural. That means there were blonde and red-headed people living in Egypt thousands of years ago, perhaps having started arriving there during the Greco-Roman period, which began 2,300 years ago. However, there's evidence that there were red-headed people in Egypt long before that. In the 19th century, the British Museum placed a mummy on public display and called him the Ginger on account of his red hair. The ginger is more like 5,400 years old and may have lived during the very beginnings of the Egyptian civilization. Speaking of the very beginnings of Egyptian civilization, let's look at a discovery that took place in Gebel Ramla in the middle of the Egyptian desert in 2019. It's not an especially pleasant discovery. It's the oldest known infant cemetery in the world. The human remains buried here range between 6,000 and 6,600 years old. That's Egypt's Neolithic era, about which virtually nothing is known. Within these graves, though, the research team found decorative artifacts, including ornamental pottery, ostrich eggshell jewelry, precious stones, and seashells. They also found weapons made of stone and even makeup kits. Many of the places in Egypt that are believed to have been occupied during the Neolithic era have since been swallowed by the Nile, so discoveries like this one offer archaeologists a rare opportunity to learn about the civilization that existed before the establishment of Egypt. We still don't know what to call this civilization, but based on their grave goods and the way they buried young children away from adults, it was clearly a sophisticated society. Archaeologists will still be finding tombs in Egypt a hundred years from now, and probably well beyond that, too. Some tombs are more interesting than others, though, and here's one that was discovered in Abydos in 2014. It's not much to look at from the outside, but back when it was built 3,300 years ago, none of what's currently visible at the site would have been visible. The entire tomb was once contained by a small pyramid, standing approximately 23 feet tall. Nothing remains of the pyramid, which suggests that it was deliberately demolished for reasons unknown, but the burial was left undisturbed. Fortunately, there was a finely crafted and well-preserved sandstone sarcophagus within the chamber, with hieroglyphic markings identifying the occupant as a scribe by the name of Horemheb. Curiously, Horemheb was buried with four other men, 12 women, and at least two children. 
It's impossible to be certain about the precise numbers, as their remains have been disarticulated and strewn around the burial chamber. Some of them have decomposed completely. Burials with small pyramids are usually associated with high-status burials, so it may be that Horemhub was a scribe with royal connections. It sometimes feels like the ancient Egyptians arranged their monuments to help future generations understand them. Why else would they leave engraved writing and illustrations everywhere? Even a location as humble as an amethyst mine, a place where slaves and common people were sent to work, contains written history, and one such discovery is currently puzzling researchers. Wadi al Hudi has been explored many times in the past, but is so full of inscriptions and drawings that much of what's there has been missed by previous expeditions. The location would have been remote at the time it was active, with not even a well to supply water any closer than two miles away. The name of Pontius Pilate is carved into the wall, as well as many references to soldiers watching the workers as they toiled away. Most puzzling of all is a stone tablet, which is 3,400 years old, and makes reference to Usursetet, a noted viceroy of Kush. It's newer than any other carving or stone in the old mine by 500 years, suggesting someone must have deliberately traveled 30 kilometers into the desert to place it at the mine, long after the mine was abandoned. Who did that, and why? Speaking of mysterious writings and inscriptions, our next Egyptian discovery is the Cairo Geniza. Rather than being a monument, the Cairo Geniza is a collection of more than 400,000 Jewish manuscript fragments that were once kept in the storeroom of the Ben Ezra Synagogue in Old Cairo. The manuscripts cover North African, Middle Eastern, and Andalusian Jewish history between the 6th and 19th centuries in deep detail as well as recording important political events. The documents provide rare and unique information about economic and cultural life during those centuries. This is the largest collection of medieval manuscripts in the world, and it contains liturgical texts, secular texts, biblical texts, and rabbinic texts. There are even a few legal documents, private letters exchanged between individuals, and even school exercise books. A wide range of merchants' account books can also be found within the Cairo Geniza, revealing a trade network that stretched as far as Rouen in France. The big question is who started collecting these documents and why? And why did their successors then continue doing so for 1,300 years? The bulk of the collection is now in the Cambridge University Library in England. There are so many incredible things to see in the Egyptian city of Luxor that sometimes the smaller things get overlooked by tourists. One of them is Hatshepsut's myrrh tree. It's little more than a stump today, but Egyptian historians are convinced that it was brought back from Hatshepsut's expedition to Punt. That makes it around 3,460 years old. Modern-day historians aren't even totally sure where Punt used to be. It's described in Egyptian records simply as a land on the Red Sea, and might have stretched from Somalia across the Horn of Africa. The story of the pharaoh's visit to Punt is told in paintings on the walls of the nearby Grand Mortuary Temple of Hatshepsut, and there are depictions of myrrh trees in the paintings, so the story could be true. However, scientists can't verify the tree's age because they can't carry out tests on it without damaging it, and the Egyptian government isn't willing to do that. If the tree really does date back to the time of Hatshepsut, it's a surprising oversight by her successor, Tutmos III. He tried to erase all documents, monuments, and other references to Hatshepsut, but somehow missed the tree. The most famous pyramids in Egypt are the ones in Cairo, but they're far from the only pyramids in Egypt. It's just that they're larger and in better condition than almost all of the others. As an example, here's what's left of the Pyramid of Senusret II in Cahun. The pyramid was built 3,800 years ago while Senusret was still alive, which meant he could give it a name. Somewhat immodestly, he called it Ka Senusret, which means Senusret Shines. Curiously, he chose to have his pyramid built in Cahun rather than Dashur, which is where the pyramid of his father, Amenemet II, is located. 
It's a significant break from a tradition that was already well established by that point, and historians aren't sure of the reason for it. He also hid the entrance to the pyramid in an unusual place. Rather than being on the north face of the pyramid, which was standard for Old and Middle Kingdom pyramids, Senesret had the entrance concealed beneath the tomb of a princess buried a few hundred feet away. It's been speculated that this may have been a measure to guard the pyramid against grave robbers, but that's just a theory. We know from Egyptian historical records that the Benben stone was supposed to have supernatural qualities. It was once found in the Temple of Ra at Heliopolis, and was the first place that the rays of the sun struck every morning. The original stone is now long lost, but it influenced the design of several sculptures and statues that still exist in Egypt today, including the capstones of the famous pyramids. The stone is thought to have symbolized the phoenix, an important creature in Egyptian mythology because of its ability to survive death and return to the living. Some historians believe that the Benben represents the seed of the phoenix on account of the fact that Ben loosely translates as fertilization in the language used at the time the Temple of Ra was built thousands of years ago. One legend says that the Benben was the mound that rose from the waters of Nu when the great god Atum created the world. If you've ever heard the reference to the Stone of Destiny in folklore, they were references to this mystical stone. Archaeologists work on Egyptian sites every day, but they don't get to make all the discoveries. In 2019, drilling work on a sewage drain in Tama Sohag had to be called to a sudden halt when workers realized they'd accidentally broken into an ancient temple. Archaeologists were summoned immediately, and they were overjoyed when they realized that the workers had stumbled across the long-lost temple of Ptolemy IV, which was now open to the air for the first time in 2,200 years. Ptolemy isn't remembered by history as a successful or popular pharaoh. He was said to be more interested in art and hedonism than he was in governing, which might explain why his temple is in an out-of-the-way location on the western bank of the Nile. It certainly explains why he was deposed by his own people, who accused him of being more interested in making art than he was in leading the country. On the other hand, he did build the largest human-powered sailing vessel ever made, the Tessera Conteres, with its crew of 4,000. The temple is less spectacular than temples made for Egypt's more successful pharaohs, but is arguably more interesting for that same reason. Since we're talking about ancient Egyptian mysteries, let's talk about one of the biggest ones. There's a hatch, or a hole, on the top of the head of the Sphinx, and nobody wants to tell the world where it leads to. In fact, very few archaeologists want to talk about the idea that there are rooms inside the Sphinx at all. The hole can clearly be seen in old pictures of the sculpture, but appears to have been filled in more recently. It's likely that very few people knew it was there at all until aerial photography became possible. Even now, it's illegal to photograph the Giza Plateau from above, which is a sure sign that there's something there that the authorities don't want people to see. Researcher Robert Schock claims to have seismic data that clearly indicates the existence of hollow chambers inside the Sphinx, and an underground tunnel that leads from the Sphinx to the Great Pyramid. Zahi Hawass has even produced a video that appears to show him accessing the chambers through a hatch and discovering a sarcophagus, although his testimony is disputed, and he now refuses to discuss his video. What's really inside the Sphinx, and why aren't we allowed to know? The Egyptians were ahead of all their contemporaries when it came to arts and crafts. To prove it, here are 27 ancient regal statues of Sekhmet, the lion-faced ancient Egyptian goddess of war. The discoveries were made at the site of the temple of Amenhotep III on the west bank of Luxor. Each of the statues is crafted from black granite. This is a difficult material to work with and must have been chosen with a specific reason in mind. Perhaps the reason was durability. It was a good choice if so because the statues are still with us thousands of years later. Most of the sculptures are more than six feet tall although there are a few smaller ones that show the goddess sitting on a throne, holding the Egyptian symbol of life in her left hand. The temple is an enormous site, spanning almost 4 million square feet. To put that in context, it's as big as 65 American football fields. 
Archaeologists think it was mostly destroyed by an earthquake about 3,200 years ago. There's still plenty more excavation work to do at the temple, so more statues and other artifacts may yet be unearthed. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching, and see you soon.